And I'm here to report that as of this morning, about five o'clock this morning, a well-controlled, peer-reviewed study carried out by the most eminent infectious disease specialist in the world, Didier Raoul, MD, PhD, out of the south of France, in which he enrolled 40 patients. Again, a well-controlled, peer-reviewed study that showed a 100% cure, right, cure rate against coronavirus. The study, which was done in the city of Marseille, involved a group of patients with confirmed COVID-19. The infection was confirmed with nasopharyngeal swabbing, which is the routine test that we do to detect infection. The study wanted to test the hypothesis that using hydroxychloroquine would improve patients with COVID-19. The first big problem with this study is how they define improvement. You would think that they would define it as actual clinical improvement, which means patients got better faster, or they got sent home faster, or their lung function improved, or something along those lines. But the only thing that they measured and considered was the same nasopharyngeal swab they did in the beginning to make the diagnosis. In other words, they just test to see if the test they used to diagnose COVID-19 infection would come back positive or negative. Now, there really is no grounds for measuring outcomes in this way. The goal of treatment in COVID-19 patients isn't to make the lab test come back negative, but to actually make the patient better. And an unsubstantiated assumption is being made here that a negative lab test means an improved patient. Not only is that a false assumption, but the paper itself provides proof of that, as we'll see. Now, this paper makes some statistical calculations right off the bat about how many patients they will need in order to draw any kind of meaningful conclusions. And they write that we calculated that a total of 48 COVID-19 patients would be required for the analysis. However, they didn't end up using 48. They actually just selected 42. And no mention is made about why they didn't achieve the targeted 48 patients they themselves felt they needed to achieve statistical significance. However, as the study progressed, the number was changed again because they removed six patients from the study. And what's most concerning is that all of the six patients they removed from the study were patients that received hydroxychloroquine. So we went from needing 48 to only getting 42 and then ended up with just 36. Now of these 36, 20 patients got hydroxychloroquine and 16 patients did not. Those 16 patients were the control group. Now at this point already, this study has some serious fundamental flaws. The outcomes here they're measuring are clinically irrelevant and the sample size of the study of 36 patients is not only small for a clinical trial in general, but even smaller than they themselves felt that they needed. Another issue with this trial is the level of illness that the patients had. Of the 36 patients that they enrolled, six patients had no symptoms at all, zero. They weren't coughing or anything. 22 patients had upper respiratory tract infections, and that basically means that they had cold-like symptoms that only involved the upper respiratory tract, so nasal congestion, coughing, fever, sore throat, that kind of thing. Only eight patients in the study had lower respiratory tract infections, which basically means that they had pneumonia and lung inflammation. The reason that this distinction is important is because it's the lung involvement that's the cause of death in patients with COVID-19. If you don't have any lung involvement, you're gonna be completely fine. You won't need oxygen, let alone a respirator. It's patients with lung involvement that we're concerned about helping the most. So the cohort of people that we care most about, the ones that need treatment the most, are just eight patients in this study. The study becomes even more problematic when you consider why those six patients in the hydroxychloroquine group were removed from the study. They go on to tell us that three of the six that were removed were removed because they got worse. They were sent to the ICU, and so the team stopped following them. But that doesn't really make much sense at all because if the patients are getting worse, why not continue to give them hydroxychloroquine and then see how they end up? They go on to say that patient number four actually died, so they emitted that patient from the study. You can't do nasopharyngeal swabs on a dead person, yet another reason to call into question using swabs as a clinical endpoint. Patient number five left the hospital, presumably they got better, and patient number six got nausea from the medicine, so they stopped the medicine on that patient. With this distorted patient selection criteria, the authors go on to state that 70% of the group that got hydroxychloroquine had negative nasopharyngeal swabs after six days, whereas only 12.5% of the control group was able to achieve negative swabs. Now, even if you ignore all the other flaws of the study up to this point, there is another plausible explanation for this that has nothing to do with hydroxychloroquine. See, we already know that younger people tend to be asymptomatic or they have mild symptoms, and they tend to spread the disease to older people. 
And if you look at the breakdown of the control group, you will see that patients here are much younger than the hydroxychloroquine group. So it's not surprising that they're still positive six days out. That's already been observed in the community. The older group of patients are the ones where the infection tends to descend down into the lungs and set up over there. And as you can see, the hydroxychloroquine group is not only the older group, but it is also the group with more infections in the lungs. Now, if you still think that nasopharyngeal swabs are some kind of valid tool that we should be looking at, take a look at this line from the study. Remember that one patient who died, the one that they omitted from the study? Well, he or she died three days after enrollment in the trial. And the day before they died, the nasopharyngeal swab was actually negative. There's also a comment in the trial that they used azithromycin on some of the patients and that decreased the viral load even faster. Now, leaving aside the obvious problem that using two drugs in such a small trial creates a confounding bias, the number of patients who got azithromycin as well is just six. And that is all that really needs to be said on the subject of azithromycin. Now, I want to be clear about my intentions here. I am not against chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. I'm not pushing an agenda here. I'm a frontline doctor, and I will soon be taking care of COVID-19 patients in my region if and when the disease hits us. I'm as eager as the next person to discover evidence that there's a drug that works that can save the lives of not only my patients, but also very possibly my own life as well. However, with healthcare resources in the world about to be stretched to the breaking point, now it is more important than ever to keep a level head and to be able to abide by good science and valid data. Like I mentioned in my last video, there are multiple trials ongoing throughout the world looking into hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine to see if they may help patients recover faster and rid themselves of this virus. We should know soon if these drugs work, and I hope they do. But this poorly designed and even more poorly executed trial does nothing at all to move the needle on this conversation.